Hi everybody, welcome and for some of you, welcome back to a new video sponsored by Lacuna Diagnostics. My name is Francesco Chan, I am a clinical pathologist, part of the Lacuna team, and today I would like to show you another interesting cytology case, this time from a cat, that I'm sure that is worth a little bit of discussion. Let's start the case. So this was a cat, American short hair, female neutered, 12 years old, that was referred to the veterinarian for a over week history of poor appetite and weight loss. On clinical examination, the vet noticed a decreased body condition score and the presence of a palpable abdominal mass. Hematology and biochemistry were essentially unremarkable. But uh, as part of the diagnostic investigation, the vet performed a abdominal ultrasound and identified the presence of enlarged abdominal lymph node and an irregular spleen. Both organs were sampled for cytology and the smears were digitalized and submitted to my attention. I'm going to show you now the cytology sample, the most representative cytology smear from the lymph node, which I think is extremely, extremely interesting. Stay tuned. Here we are now to the most exciting part of the case, which is the examination of the cytology smear. So the first step, as we discussed in the previous case, is looking at the slide at low power and evaluate the cellularity and the preservation. Because if these are not adequate, appropriate, the sample might be non-diagnostic. Now we are at a very low power and the only thing we can say is that there is some material, pinkish purple material on the slide, so there are good chances that this slide will contain cells. However, we need to move at 10x in order to be sure of that. And that's what I'm going to do right now. So we move at 10x. And yes, we can confirm actually that uh, the sample has adequate cellularity and also I would say moderate, if not adequate preservation. We have uh, here and there, and I'm going to point them out now, some broken nuclei or bare nuclei. However, the vast majority of the cell, as you can see here, they are all intact. So this sample is likely going to be diagnostic. We need to move now at higher magnification in order to describe the cells and trying to establish the uh, origin of these cells. So we move at 40x. And we can immediately see the presence of different subtypes. We have a main population that I'm going to point out now of very large, round, and discrete cells that, uh, as you can see, they have a very high nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. And this is a very typical, I would say, unique, peculiar of lymphoid cells. And we're going to describe these cells later on because they seem to be the main cell population, so likely also the most important cell population. We then have other cell type. As you can see here, we have some neutrophils, which have a typical segmented uh, and lobulated nucleus, and these are likely going to be blood derived. And then we also have a few small lymphocytes, which are very important in this case because they allow you to appreciate much better how large these other lymphoid cells are. So let's describe a little bit these lymphoid cells. So the cytoplasm is a scant, like in these cells, to moderate, like here is quite basophilic blue in color with the defined borders. And sometimes it also contains clear intracytoplasmic vacuoles, which is a feature that is seen quite often in cats. The nuclei are very large because they go between three up to five, six red blood cells. And uh, they're round, but they're often indented. You can see here and here the indentation, but sometimes uh, they are very, very irregular. So it's barely recognizable, I would say, the lymphoid origin. 
you can see here how irregular sometimes they can be. Other times they're perfectly round. And then another important element is the presence of frequent mitotic figures. And you have an example here. But there are definitely other examples that we can see by moving around and looking at other of these groups of cells. Let's see if I can find another one for you. So you can say that you have seen a few mitosis. Here we have another one, very, very nice mitosis, and possibly another one here. So we have a main population of large or very large lymphoid cells and frequent mitotic figures. This is indicative of a high-grade large cell lymphoma. We can then obviously perform additional investigations like flow cytometry, for example, or immunocytochemistry to establish if these lymphoid cells are either T or B cell in origin. Another important element that I would like you to focus on is represented by all the structures, all the material that is present in the background. If you notice, uh, we have already discussed uh, the presence of uh, red cells. We have already discussed uh, the presence of lymphoglandular bodies uh, that I'm going to point out now. And they are essentially fragments uh, of uh, cytoplasm from uh, broken lymphoid cells. We also have uh, broken nuclei, so nuclear material, free chromatin in the background. And then we also have uh, sometimes the presence of small platelet clumps. On top of this, uh, there are also other structures that you might have noticed here and there. You can see one here. You can see another one here. Another one up here and up here. So these structures, they have a sort of U, a sort of comma shape, and they seem to have a sort of basophilic, a dark, a round a central structure, and then a sort of much lighter a basophilic tail. And if you move around in this light, you will see that these structures are actually quite frequent. They're actually quite numerous. And sometimes they are individual. Sometimes they tend to form some sort of groups. And these are protozoa. And in particular, they are toxoplasma-like organisms. We're going to talk about this later on. And we're going to show how toxoplasma, but also other uh, protozoa of the same uh, group, of the same uh, category, can have uh, the same morphology and uh, appear exactly like that. The final cytological diagnosis of this case was high-grade large cell lymphoma and the presence of toxoplasma-like organisms. So let's start talking a little bit about lymphoma. And if we look at the prognostic factors for feline lymphoma, what we're going to find is the anatomic location, the cell morphology and architecture, so essentially the subclassification of lymphoma, the WHO clinical stage and substage, the response to the initial treatment, which is usually a multi-agent chemotherapy, and then the retroviral status, so the presence or absence of infection like FLV and FIV. I have highlighted the first two to show you how important is the anatomic location and the identification of the subtype of lymphoma we are dealing with, and to point out how a generic classification of lymphoma shouldn't be considered enough. From an anatomical point of view, lymphoma can be classified into nodal when we have involvement of one or more lymph nodes, can be considered alimentary when there is a primary involvement of any of the GI tract, mediastinal when there is an involvement of the thymus or involvement of the mediastinal lymph nodes, and extranodal when any other organ is involved. In cats, mainly kidneys and nasal areas are considered the most common sites for extranodal lymphoma. 
from a cytological and histological point of view, things are a little bit more complicated, but I want to start with a sort of simplified cytologic approach to evaluate lymphoma cases that can be used in both dogs and cats. And this system can be found in the Rose Ruskin cytology book. The classification is based mainly on two elements, which are the cell size and the mitotic activity. The cell size is determined by comparing the size of the nucleus of the neoplastic lymphoid cells with the red cell. We will talk about small lymphoid cells when this uh, uh, nuclear size is below 1, 1.5 red blood cells, intermediate when they are between 2 and 2.5, and large lymphoid cells when the nuclei of these cells are larger than 3 red blood cells. We then look at the mitotic activity. I didn't say on purpose mitotic index because that's a histological parameter that is also determined in a different way. We say that there is a low mitotic activity when we have between zero and one mitosis in five high power field intermediate when we have between two and three mitosis and high mitotic activity when we have more than three mitosis in five high power field. You will see that most of the time in low grade lymphomas we will have small cells, small lymphoid cells and a low mitotic activity. In most high-grade lymphomas, like in this case, we have usually intermediate to large lymphoid cells and a moderate to high mitotic activity. Of course, there are some exceptions, and this is the reason why more advanced classification systems have been proposed over the years, and these classification systems are still in use. The KIEL and the WHO are the classification systems currently used to subclassify both the canine and feline lymphoma. Each of these classification systems is composed of several different subtypes, and each of these are different in terms of morphology, and often they are also different in terms of prognosis. As you can imagine, and as you can see from this uh, slide, from this uh, picture, these uh, classification systems are quite complicated. However, the principle behind this uh, classification system are relatively simple. I would like now to explain very, very briefly the main principle behind the WHO classification system. These include the anatomic location of the lymphoma, the cell morphology and the tissue architecture, and by tissue architecture I mean if the lymphoma is diffuse or if it is nodular. Then the phenotype, so if you're dealing with a T-cell lymphoma or with a B-cell lymphoma, and then the genotype. However, this matter has not been investigated in veterinary medicine as much as in humans. This classification system is essentially histopathic histological, histopathological. However, in many cases, cytology with other immunophenotyping techniques like immunocytochemistry and flow cytometry are able to predict the WHO subtype of lymphoma. When I say before that the cell morphology is an important principle behind the WHO classification, this is because depending on which stage of the maturation of the T and the B lymphoid cell the neoplastic clone arises from, we will have a different uh, lymphoma subtype with a different morphology. If the neoplastic clone arises from the early stages of maturation of lymphoid cells, either from the stem cell or from the early T and early B lymphoid cells, we will have a lymphoblastic lymphoma or an acute lymphoid leukemia. If the neoplastic clone arises from the late stage maturation of the T or the B lymphoid cells, we will have a lymphoma, either low or high grade, 
or if we have involvement of bone marrow and peripheral blood only, a chronic lymphoid leukemia, a CLL. This uh, paper uh, is uh, one of the many papers that has been published uh, regarding feline lymphoma and where the WHO classification have been applied. I wanted to mention this uh, paper just to show you how the uh, classification according to the WHO system has an important prognostic significance. And as you can see here, the median survival time of these patients were extremely different depending on the lymphoma subtype. And this is to highlight once more how a general diagnosis of lymphoma is not sufficient and a further subclassification in most cases is definitely needed. Another important aspect that we shouldn't forget about this case is the presence of toxoplasma-like organisms. These are a group of protozoan parasites of the family Sarcocystidae that can be seen in the feline species because the cat is a definitive host. What is important though is that we do not jump immediately on a diagnosis of toxoplasma because other organisms like Neospora, Sarcocystis and Amondia can appear, actually appear from a morphological point of view, absolutely identical. In this specific case, a diagnosis of toxoplasma was confirmed on PCR. Toxoplasmosis is often an opportunistic infection, so can often be seen in patients that are also immunocompromised and in relation to the feline species in cats with retroviral infections like FELV and FIV. We were not aware, unfortunately, of the retroviral status of this cat but also in patients with neoplasia or patients undergoing chemotherapy and immunocompromised because of that. We have two take-home messages from this case. The first is that lymphoma is a complex entity, and so a simple diagnosis of lymphoma shouldn't be considered sufficient. We should try as much as we can to subclassify lymphoma because as we have seen, this uh, may give a different prognosis and also different treatment options. And then multiple diseases can coexist in the same patient or in the same sample, like in this case, and sometimes these can be related, sometimes they are completely unrelated. I want to give a big uh, thank from all the Lacuna team, and uh, I'm looking forward to see you soon to discuss another case.